Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Part 4 The Stockade Chapter 16 Narrative continued by the Doctor How the ship was abandoned It was about half past one Three bells in the six sea phrase That two boats went ashore for the Sponia Spanish Bonian, which the captain and squire and I were talking matters over in the cabin. Had there been a breath of wind, we should have fallen on the six mutineers who were left aboard with a slip or cable and away to sea. The wind was wanting to complete our hopelessness. Down came Hunter, the news that Jim Hawkins had slipped into a boat and was gone ashore with the rest. It never occurred to us to doubt Jim Hawkins. We were alarmed for his safety. With that man, with the men and temper they were in, it seemed an even chance that we should see the lad again. We run on deck. The pictures bubbling in the seams, the nursery stench of the place turned me sick. If ever man smelt fever and dysentery, it was in the abominable anchorage. Six grand was sitting grumbling under sail in the forecastle. The shore we could see the gigs were fast. They fast, and a man sitting in each harm. By where the river runs in, one of them was whistling Lib the Librario. Waiting was a, was a, a strain. It was decided that Hunter and I should go ashore with a jolly boat in quest, quest for information. Gigs that, that leaned into their right, to the right. Hunter and I pulled straight in, direction of Stockholm upon the chart. Two who were left guarding their house. Boats seen hustle of our appearance. Then the Barrero stopped off. We could see the pair discussing what they ought to do. Had they gone and told Silver all oh, might have turned out differently, but he had their orders, I suppose, and decided to sit quietly where they were and hark back again to the Barrero. There was a slight bend in the coast. They steered so it might, so as if so as to put it, it between us even before we landed we had thus lost sight of the gigs i jumped out and came as near running as a dust with a big silk handkerchief under my hat for course so and embrace a pistol ready crying for safety i had i had not gone a hundred yards when i reached the stockade this is how it was a spring of clear water rose along almost the top of the knoll. Round the knoll, enclosing the spring, they had clapped a stout log house fit to hold two score of people, a pinch and a loophole for muskery on either side. All round this they had completed a wide, cleared a wide space, and the thing was completed by a paling six feet high, a door opening, too strong to pull down without time and labour, to open the shelter of the besiegers. The people in the log house that had them in every way, that he stood quiet in the shelter, the shop was others like partridges. All he wanted was a good watch and food. For short of a complete surprise, he might have held a place against the regiment. What particularly took my fancy was a spring, for though we had a good enough place, of it in the cabin of Hysponia, with plenty of arms and ammunition, and things to eat, excellent wines. There had been one thing overlooked. We had no water. I was thinking this over when there came ringing over the island a cry of a man, quite a deaf. I was not new to one at deaf. I have served this clear highness, Duke of Cumberland. I've got to wound myself at Fort Troy. I know my pulse went dot and carried one. Jim Hawkins is gone, was my first thought. It's something to have been an old soldier, but more still to have been a doctor. There's no time to dilly dally in our work. So an hour I'd made my mind in, up my mind instantly. Was no, and had with no time lost to return to shore, jumped on board a jolly boat. And a good fortune hunter pulled a good oar. He made the water fly, and the boat was soon alongside. I boarded the schooner. I found them all shaken as if as was natural. Sky was sitting down as white as a sheet, thinking of harm. 
he had led us to in good soul. I won a six four cross of hands is a little better. There's a man, says Captain Smollett, nodding towards him. New to his work, he came saying hand hand fainting doctor, when he heard a cry, never touched the rudder, and that man would join us. I tell my plan, Captain. And between us, we settled on the details of accomplishment. We got put our old red roof, roof in the gallery between the cabin and the forecastle with three or four loaded muskets and mattress protection. Hunter brought the boat round under the stern point. Joyce and I went to work, loading her with pounds of tins, musket balls of bellows of biscuits, kegs of walk. Casket of a coconut and my invaluable medicine chest. In the meantime, the squire and the captain stayed on deck. The lavern latter held the coxswain, who was principal man aboard. Mr. Ahrens, he said, if there as the two of you of us with a page of pistol of each, if any one of us the ticks make a signal, the inscription that man is dead. There's a good deal taken aback. They were too good to take a bet after a little consolation. One and all tumbled down for companion, making no doubt for us to take us on the reading. But when they saw Red Roof waiting for them, a spared cannery, they went about their ship at once. A head popped out again on the deck. Down, dog, cries the captain. And, two, and the head popped back again. We heard no more for the time. These six very faint-hearted seamen. But I, this time, tumbling things in as they came. We had a jolly boat loaded as much as we dared. Joyce and I put through the stern port and we made for shore again as fast as the oars could take us. The secretary tripped fairly, fairly around the watchers along shore. The Ibarara was dropped again just before we lost sight of them. High in a little point, one of them whipped ashore the and disappeared. I half of mine changed my plan and destroyed their boats. I feared that Silver and the others might be close at hand. And all went might very well be lost by trying for too much. We had, very, we had soon touched land in the same place as before, except to revision the blockhouse. All three made the first journey heavily laden and tossed our stores over the passalade. They leaving Joyce to guard them, one man to shore. But with the half a dozen muskets, Hunter and I returned to the jolly boat, loaded ourselves once more, so we proceeded without pausing to take breath to the whole cargo we stowed. The two servants took up their position in the blockhouse, and I, with all my power, scurried back to Estonia. Then we should have risked, without we should have risked the second boat load seems more daring than it really was. They had advantage numbers, of course. We had advantages at arms, but none but one of the men ashore had a musket. Before they could get within range of, for pistol shooting, we flattened ourselves. We should be able to give a good account of half a dozen at least. The sky was waiting for me at a stern window, all his faintness gone from him. He caught the painter and made it fast. He fell to, lo- to loading the boat. For our own life, very nice pulp powder. Biscuit was on the cargo. Only a musket and a cup, just a piece for the squire, me, a roof for the captain. The rest of the arms of powder we dropped overboard in two fathoms of warm for water, so we could see the bright steel shining far below us in the sun and the green sandy bottom. By this time the tides were beginning to ebb and the ship was swinging round to her anchor. Voices were heard faintly hollering in the direction of two gigs, though this was assured us was for us for Joyce, the hunter, we were well to the eastward. He warned our party to be off. If Ruth retreated from his boat place in the gallery and dropped into the boat, which he then brought round to the ship's counter, we hand uh, uh, to Captain Smollett. Now, men, he said, do you hear me? There was no answer for forecastle. It is to you, Abing Ray, and it is you I am speaking. Still no reply. Gray resumed, Mr. Smollett, a little louder. I am leaving the ship, and I order you to follow your captain. I know you're good men at the bottom. I dare say not one of you lot, lot 
as bad as he makes out. I have my watch here in my hand. I'll give you 30 seconds to join me in. And pause. Come, my dear, my dear, fine fellow, she knows the captain. Don't hang around so long and stains. I risk my life. I life of these good gentlemen. Every second, there's a sudden scuffle. A sound of blows are bowed. Out by saving Graham, a knife claps on the side of the cheek and came running to the captain like a dog to the whistle. I am with you, sir, said he. But the next moment, he and the captain dropped aboard of, of us and we had shoved off and were given away. We were clear out of the ship, but not yet ashore in our stockade. 